This lesson covers California 8th grade science content standard 3A, which states that students know the structure of the atom and know it is composed of protons, neutrons, and electrons. The learning objectives, or things you should be able to do by the end of this lesson, are as follows. You should be able to describe the arrangement of electrons, protons, and neutrons within an atom. You should be able to explain how Rutherford developed his atomic model. You should be able to list the evidence that showed the existence of electrons, protons, and neutrons, and you should be able to compare Thompson's, Rutherford's, and Bohr's models of the atom. In the last lesson, we stated that virtually everything in the universe is made of matter, and the smallest part of matter are called atoms, and that all matter is made of atoms. We stated that the atoms contain a nucleus at their center, which are made up of positively charged protons and neutrons that have no charge. And that going around that nucleus, we have the negatively charged electrons. Now, you might be wondering, if atoms are so small and they can't be seen, and they are made up of particles that are even smaller, how did we come to know that these small, small particles exist. And that is going to be the focus of this lesson. We are going to talk about how we discovered individual parts of the atom. Early experiments on atoms were done using these, and this is a cathode ray tube. A cathode ray is a stream of particles that can be seen when an electric current passes through a vacuum tube. And when we say vacuum tube, we mean that there is no air inside the tube. But the ray that you can see there, which looks like a, a green beam of light, it travels from a negatively charged disk at one end of the tube to a positively charged disk at the other end of the tube. And there was a scientist and his name was J.J. Thompson. And Thompson liked to do experiments using these cathode ray tubes. And he noticed that when a charged plate was placed in close proximity to the cathode ray tubes, that the ray didn't travel in a straight line anymore. What Thompson noticed was that when a charged plate was placed next to the cathode ray, the ray would bend towards the positive plate. Now, as you probably know, opposite charges attract each other, and negative charges, or like charges, I should say, repel each other. So when Thompson noticed that the beam of particles moved toward the positive plate, he concluded that they must have a negative charge and he named these particles electrons. Up until this point, because of the work of John Dalton, J.J. Thompson and everyone else thought that atoms were these positively charged spheres, kind of like marbles. But after the cathode ray experiment and the discovery of electrons, Thompson decided there was a time for a new model of the atom. And so, he said that atoms were these positively charged spheres with the negatively charged electrons that he had discovered mixed in. And so he thought that the atoms sort of look like this picture, which has a positively charged material evenly distributed with the negatively charged electrons mixed in. This model of the atom became known as the plum pudding model, and it's still known as that today. Now, here is another picture of what a plum pudding atom might look like. Here you can see that the pink area is the positively charged material, and that the yellowish particles are the negatively charged electrons mixed in. Now, I don't know about you, but 
I've never had plum pudding, and I don't know anyone else that's had it either. So I like to think of Thompson's model as kind of like chocolate chip cookie dough, which I think all of us have had and most of us probably enjoy. But you can think of the cookie dough as the positively charged material and the actual chocolate chips as the negatively charged electrons. But again, the idea is the same. And Thompson called his model the plum pudding model. When scientists do experiments, they want to be able to have their experiments replicated or have their findings verified. All good scientists do this. And as a result, J.J. Thompson had a student by the name of Ernest Rutherford. And Ernest Rutherford wanted to be able to prove and add validity to his professor's work. So he set out an experiment to do that. This is a picture of Ernest Rutherford. And he is famous for what is called the gold foil experiment. And you can see this experiment set up here. And to conduct the gold foil experiment, he took positively charged alpha particles, which were emitted from helium atoms, and shot them towards a thin piece of gold foil, which is why it's called the gold foil experiment. And when these positively charged particles would encounter the gold foil, Rutherford predicted that the particles would be deflected by the negative charge of the electrons which J.J. Thompson had discovered. And he did this again to prove what his professor had found. And so this picture here is showing you the path of the positively charged alpha particles or the helium atoms moving from left to right. And in the middle you see the plum pudding gold atoms. And what Rutherford predicted would happen was that most of the particles would just go straight through and then hit the back of the detector screen in which in case it would show a speck of light. But he predicted that only a few of the particles would be deflected by that negative charge of the electrons because we know that opposite charges repel each other and that the, he thought the negative charge of the atoms would deflect. But what he actually found is that the majority of the particles, again shown here, did pass straight through the gold foil. And he noticed that a few of them were deflected to the left and to the right. But every now and then, he noticed that some of the alpha particles would be strongly deflected and even less frequent every now and then one would bounce completely backwards and so again you can see in this picture that some of the most of the particles went straight through some were deflected a little bit some were deflected a lot and every now and then some of them would bounce backwards and this and this led Ernest Rutherford to some very important conclusions first of all because most of the particles moved straight through the foil, he concluded that one, the atom is mostly empty space. And also there must be the existence of electrons as Thompson had predicted because some of the particles which were positively charged were deflected slightly by the negative charge of the electrons. But he also concluded that these alpha particles that bounce backwards must have encountered a mass that was bigger than theirs and that mass had to be positive because of the fact that the particles bounced backwards. So this led to the discovery of the nucleus because that mass that was encountered had to be large in comparison to the alpha particles and it had to be positive. So this led to the discovery of the nucleus. So although Rutherford set out to prove his professor's Thompson's work, he actually ended up being able to disprove it and come up with a better model. I mean, he didn't disprove it in the sense that electrons don't exist, but he did prove that 
there is a large positive, positively charged mass at the center of an atom, called which he called the nucleus, and that those positive particles that make it up are called protons. So Rutherford's gold foil experiment also proved the existence of positively charged protons. And as a result, he came up with this model that you're looking at, which is kind of what we think of when we see or think of atoms today. It's mostly empty space. It's got a positively charged center known as the nucleus. He also later discovered the presence of a neutron, which you can see here as well. So now you should be able to complete these learning objectives. You should be able to describe the arrangement of electrons, protons, and neutrons within an atom. The electrons orbit the nucleus, and the nucleus in the center of the atom, which is composed of protons and neutrons. You should be able to explain how Rutherford developed his model of the atom. That was by performing the gold foil experiment. And you should be able to list the evidence that showed the existence of protons, electrons, and neutrons. T um, Thompson's model or Thompson's experiment with the cathode ray tubes and the fact that the cathode rays moved toward the positive plate it proved the existence of the negatively charged electrons. Rutherford's gold foil experiment it proved the existence of the positively charged protons and the protons and the electrons didn't account for the total mass of an atom and Rutherford later ended up discovering that the rest of the mass was made up by these particles called neutrons which have no charge. That was all for part one of discovering parts of the atom. In part two, we'll talk about Bohr's model of the atom, in which case you'll be able to complete the final learning objective, which is to compare Thomson's, Rutherford's, and Bohr's model of the atom.